Okay, we're going to get into chapter 10, which is going to be the nutrients present in calcified structures. This class or this chapter is mostly on uh, minerals and how they play a role. Uh, this page, chapter starts on page 176. Um, in your weekly uh, class, there is um, a handout with a chart on it, which will go through uh, both the um, mineral and it'll have like what the signs and symptoms are of hypo and hyper. It will have uh, the RDA and the upper uh, intake limit and um, it would probably be a good idea for you if you're someone who prints these out um, and then fills them out by hand um, or if you are someone who likes to um, complete them digitally um, it's up to you but I would highly highly recommend that you fill those out as we go through this chapter um, and then whatever isn't on there like there are some ultra trace minerals where a lot of the um, requirements and the the dietary uh, recommendations aren't there because you know they they just aren't there and that's okay uh, but just write down what is present in this book um, and then that's a really great way to study for the final and the midterm but it is also going to be pretty uh, helpful when you begin studying for your uh, national board exam so um, if i were you i'd pause go open or print that uh, handout and uh, and then come back for the rest of this so this chapter is mostly on like minerals um, and these trace element concentrations in human enamel and dentin so we're going to talk about each of the uh, minerals that are present in this chapter but um, we're also going to talk about how they relate to dental health as well uh, there are very small amounts of several minerals are essential for optimal growth and development. So while these are trace elements, um, they're ultra trace elements, and you know they're not considered um, part of the macronutrient, they're more the micronutrient, it doesn't mean they're any less important. They are uh, essential for uh, the way that those other macronutrients are absorbed and processed and, and, and released. And so um, even though they're, they're needed in much smaller amounts, they're not less important. The role of minerals may not be obvious as you clinically assess patients. Um, you know, when you see something that is off about a patient, they might not be the very first thing you think of. Um, typically, you kind of exhaust all of the other possible avenues before you end up here. Um, as far as the upper intake levels, you'll find that a lot of these minerals don't have them. And the reason for that is because there's a lack of data. Uh, it is unethical for us to overdose people to try to find out how much of this is um, dangerous. And so we don't do that. Uh, there are animal testing, um, but we can only sort of make our best guesses as to how a human would react to that kind of thing. Um, and then available evidence suggests that ultra trace uh, minerals may be physiological uh, essential. Yes, um, most of these, yes. And then some of them is like, well, we don't, you know, uh, a complete deficiency isn't really present in very many people. And so we actually have no idea if removing the mineral would be harmful to us or not, uh, because, you know, that would also be unethical to do. Um, we just sort of watch and and see you can find uh, more information about everything as far as like how much of it is in enamel and how much of it is in dentin in a parts per million uh sort of um view on page 177 which is table 10.1 so moving right into copper copper is the third largest trace element found in the human body um, after iron and zinc it functions in the formation of red blood cells and connective tissue. I'm sure you guys uh, learned a lot about connective tissue in perio um, and probably histo and embryo as well. Um, and so copper plays an important role in the formation of that, which is pretty important for us. And then it is a catalyst in the formation of collagen. Again, collagen being pretty important in connective tissue. Um, a component of many enzymes that function in oxidative reactions, so our ability to break things down. 
Copper containing enzymes encourage production of neurotransmitters, including norepinephrine and dopamine. So without copper or with a, a, a smaller amount of copper, we are not able to produce norepinephrine or dopamine. Um, it plays two other roles, and those are nutrient metabolism and immune function. Um, copper is readily incorporated into tooth enamel. You'll see on page 177, uh, copper is 0 0.1 to 130 parts per million found in enamel. And then radiographic fluorescence imaging shows that it has an increased concentration of copper in carious portions of the tooth. So while we don't know if copper is helping or hurting those carious lesions, we do know that it is there for sure in carious lesions. Uh, my idea is that because it's a mineral, it's probably helping, but you know. As far as the uh, recommended dietary allowance and the tolerable upper intake level, I'm not going to read those out loud to you because I'm going to trip up all, all over those numbers. So take a moment, just write those down on your chart. Um, you'll also see that copper is broken down in life stages. That's going to be in table 10.2 at the top of page 177. So if you'd like to check that out, it is there. Uh, approximately one third of the dietary copper is going to be absorbed. That occurs in the stomach and the duodenum. Um, absorption is going to be enhanced by a low pH and will be diminished by large amounts of calcium and zinc. Uh, so while one third is absorbed, that's the average. Uh, so someone who is more acidic will absorb more and someone who um, has more calcium and zinc in their diet will absorb less than that. Sources for copper are going to be in seafood, such as shellfish, oysters, and crabs. It's in liver, nuts like sesame and sunflower seeds, soy products, legumes, and cocoa. As far as hyper and hypostates of copper, uh, copper toxicity is very rare because obviously people don't absorb as much, they only absorb what they need, and then they're able to um, excrete it when they need to. Uh, serum copper levels elevated. Uh, we'll find those in patients who have rheumatoid arthritis, uh, someone who has had a myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack, and then conditions requiring estrogen, which is more likely like menopause or hormonal dis uh, disruptions, and pregnancy. We'll see slightly higher serum copper levels in those people. Um, Wilson's disease is when there is a metabolic disorder in which large amounts of copper accumulate in the liver, kidney, brain, and cornea. This is going to cause a brown or a green ring around um, the eye, and that is called the Kaiser Fleischer ring. Okay, Wilson's disease and the uh, Kaiser Fleischer ring that can uh, be on your national board exam. You will probably see it on a quiz or a test of mine, but it can appear on boards and it has very often done so. So uh, if I were you, I would write down Wilson's disease and the Kaiser Fleischer ring are uh, associated with copper. And it is when you have a, um, a genetic abnormality that doesn't allow you to uh, you know, get rid of the amount of copper in your system. And so you end up building it up um, and not only builds up in the cornea right it builds up in the liver kidney brain and cornea but the symptom the way we know is because of that ring in the cornea as far as hypo states of copper um, a deficiency can occur whenever someone is taking a zinc supplement so uh, we see this more in zinc supplements than in calcium supplements because people are pretty careful about those. Um, but anytime there is a lot of zinc or calcium, it's going to reduce the amount of copper that the person can absorb, right? Um, we see this more in people who are on um, like a tube feeding, the total parenteral nutrition. That is when they are unable to eat, so they get fed uh, via a feeding tube. Um, we see that in, in individuals like that because they do a lot of supplementation um, that way. And then the symptoms of hypo 
of copper are going to be the decreased hair and skin pigmentation, the hematological abnormalities, which will be a low white blood cell count, and abnormal formation of cross linkages in collagen and elastin. This is going to result in a failure to grow in children. It is going to have spontaneous fractures, osteoporosis, arthritis, arterial disease, and ultimately uh, marked bone deformities. So uh, especially in children, we want to make sure that we're not supplementing them incorrectly um, because this could certainly happen. Um, this is more so like long-term um, deficiencies, not necessarily a very short-term deficiency, um, but we see this more in children who are on feeding tubes for uh, some other type of medical condition. The physiologic roles of selenium will be to function as a cofactor for an antioxidant enzyme that protects membrane lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids from oxidative damage. It's just basically, uh, it's an, a cofactor for an antioxidant. It's going to impact, uh, have an impact on skeletal integrity and contributes to the maintenance of normal immune function. And it works together with vitamin E um, in the same way that vitamin E is also an antioxidant, uh, anytime you are low in one, either selenium or vitamin E, you're going to need more of the other in order to kind of make up that balance. And it is present in tooth enamel and dentin. Um, and it's thought that it is absorbed during uh, amylogenesis. So not um, as a part of like the remineralization process, but more so just during the um, um, like histology, embryology kind of uh, uh, factors. The requirement for selenium is going to be 55 micrograms per day for adults, and the tolerable upper intake level is going to be 400 micrograms a day for adults. If you go on page 179 in your book, table 10.3, you'll see that life stages and how those uh, different life stages will affect the need, the recommended uh recommended need. Um, typical intake here in the United States is between 60 to 220 micrograms a day. So people fall right into where they are supposed to. Selenium is found in animal products, especially seafood, liver, kidney, and other meats. Um, selenium in dairy products and eggs is going to be more absorbed, like more readily absorbed. It is more bioavailable than selenium from other foods. Um, it is also found in whole grain products, nuts and mushrooms, um, but they aren't as easily absorbed. Um, for vegetarians and vegans, um, one of the best recommendations is to eat uh, a Brazil nut once a week because that has all of the selenium that you would require for, uh, for about a week. Hyper and hypostates of selenium. So uh, in cases of extreme, um, like extra selenium in the diet can lead to cirrhosis of the liver. Cirrhosis is just when the uh, cells in your liver start to um, die off faster than they are replaced. Um, it may promote dental caries when given pre-eruptively. So uh, as those teeth are forming, if there's too much selenium, then it could get in the way of the uh, mineralization process for teeth as they are forming. Um, symptoms of too much selenium will be nausea and vomiting, weakness, dermatitis, hair loss, white blotchy nails, and garlicky breath odor. Um, I'm not sure which test subject had garlicky breath that day, and then the studies had to include garlicky breath. I, you know, I'm not really sure how that works, but I think that's pretty funny that they uh, that they included that one. Um, don't focus too much on that. It's nausea and vomiting is going to be that first symptom of uh, of hyper selenium. And then hypostates of selenium are going to be a cardiomyopathy called Kishan's disease. Kishan's disease is associated with um, certain rural parts of China where they don't have enough selenium and then they also don't import a lot of their foods from other places. They grow their food off of the land um, there and they you know eat it there. And so um, they develop a severe, severe selenium deficiency. Um, then 
if that happens, they get Kishan's disease and they start supplementing, it can help that cardiomyopathy, but it won't um, get rid of it completely. So all you need to know as far as your the rest of this course and for uh, your board exam is that Kishan's disease is associated with um, hyposelenium. Um, and then toxicity, like having too much or too little, it's not something that we see a lot in people. Um, it is something that we see sometimes in animals that are, um, you know, they eat grass from a certain area where the, the land doesn't have any selenium in it, right? Because, you know, mineral deposits come from soil. Um, and so, you know, if animals are living in an area where there isn't any, then they can possibly see some of these symptoms. But um, because people typically uh, in today's society, they, you know, sort of share food from all over the place, uh, typically we, we get enough selenium. So physiologic roles of chromium. One is that it is odorless and tasteless. You can't tell when you're eating it. Uh, it's involved in carbohydrate and lipid metabolism because it will potentiate the action of insulin. And while it seems like, oh, if it helps insulin work better, then we should probably give it to type 2 diabetics. Well, unfortunately, it looks like the, the evidence that would show that it would help um, you know, using like chromium supplements for people who are type 2 diabetic, it hasn't shown very good um, results. So um, the best way to get enough chromium is just to eat a, uh, a diet that is um, varied, that has some sources in it. As far as those requirements go, the um, adequate intake is going to be anywhere from 20 to 35 micrograms a day for adults. The average chromium content in a well-balanced diet is probably around 13.4 micrograms per 1,000 calories. So for someone who eats a 2,000 calorie diet, they'll have double this as well. Um, you can see this in your book on page 179, table 10.4 will have the chromium recommendations broken down by age groups. Chromium is very poorly absorbed and that um, poorer absorption starts um, as you get older, so the more you age, the, the less able you are to absorb it. Um, some of those sources are going to be in meat, um, whole grain cereals and wheat germs, nuts and mushrooms. You'll find a lot that whole grain cereals and nuts contain most of the mineral content that you need. And uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act requires the U.S. Environmental Protection Agent, Protection Agency to review and update the National Primary Drinking Water Standards. Current EPA standard for chromium in public water systems is not to exceed 100 parts per billion. Not parts per million, per billion. So, um, I mean, we expect to see a certain amount of mineral content in our water supply systems. Um, but they do regulate. As far as hyper and hypostates, hyper um, excessive amounts of chromium will cause uh, liver damage or lung cancer, and severe hypostates of chromium will be in decreased insulin sensitivity, a glucose intolerance, which are pretty much the same thing, and an increased risk of diabetes. Those three all mean the same thing. Moving on to manganese, you'll see that a lot of the um, minerals as they continue throughout this chapter, um, they have a lot less information because they are needed, um, well, they're, they're a lot less studied. So um, the physiologic requirements for manganese, it, the role that it plays is going to be essential in several enzyme systems. It's important for optimal bone matrix development in the prevention of osteoporosis. Um, it aids in insulin production, and it will be a part of amino acid, cholesterol, and carbohydrate metabolism. Um, you'll see that manganese is going to be absorbed in the liver and excreted in bile. And if you look in page 180 um, at table 10.5, you'll see that um, recommendation for manganese, manganese broken down uh, per age group. Um, the medium intake for manganese in the United States is 2.1 to 2.3 micrograms, I'm sorry, milligrams per day for men and 1.6 to 1.8 milligrams per day for women. 
the um, average intake um, is 1.8 to 2.3 for adults. So if we put them both together, 1.8 to 2.3 milligrams. The tolerable upper intake level is going to be 11 milligrams per day for adults. The sources for manganese are going to be in whole grain cereals, legumes, nuts, tea, leafy greens, and infant formula, which of course they've added because um, they don't want children to be um, um, deficient. Uh, the bioavailability for manganese is going to be better from meats, milk, and eggs, um, which we see um, um, people have a better ability to absorb those sources versus the sources you see here. But uh, even though they're, they're much smaller in amount of manganese in, in milk and meat, um, it is better absorbed from those sources. As far as hyperstates of manganese, um, it is an environmental contaminant um, because it does cause issues. Um, and we see it in elevated concentrations in uh, salivary plaque and enamel that are associated with increased caries. Um, so here, remember, we're seeing the word associated. We're not seeing it caused. So while we, we do see more manganese in cavities, we don't necessarily think that it's causing those cavities. Um, as far as symptoms go for when you have too much manganese, there is ataxia, headache, fatigue, and anxiety. Um, we saw this in um, manganese miners. So uh, people who work in a mine for manganese, um, they were exposed to this um, mineral um, in very, very large amounts. And so they developed some, a syndrome that is similar to Parkinson's disease, um, and it is called manganese madness. So um, while it, it is really easy to remember that manganese madness is probably associated with manganese, what you need to remember about this is that it is going to be similar to Parkinson's disease, and we see it in minors. Not minors like children, minors like people who mine. So hypostates of manganese um, has never been reported in someone who eats a normal diet. Um, we see people who don't have enough uh, manganese is more so in people who have that enteral um, or that total parenteral um, um, feeding. People who are fed through a feeding tube um, can develop this kind of issue. Um, the symptoms for hypo or not enough manganese is going to be abnormal formation of bone and cartilage, growth restriction, congenital malformations, impaired glucose tolerance, and poor reproductive performance. So you'll probably see that um, as far as bone formation, growth restriction, and congenital for malformations, this is having to do with both uh, prenatal um, levels of manganese and child manganese. Moving on to molybdenum or molybdenum, it is uh, a, the physiological roles will be that it functions as an enzyme cofactor. It is thought it may inhibit caries formation. You can see more information in table 10.6 in your book on page 181. The requirements for the uh, recommended daily allowance is going to be 45 micrograms per day for adults. The tolerable upper intake level will be 2,000 micrograms for adults. Good sources for molybdenum are going to be legumes, whole grain cereals, and nuts. Um, liver and many vegetables are actually poor sources of molybdenum. And then hypostates of uh, molybdenum is going to be the... Um, it says, except for deficiency reported during administration of TPN, which is the total parenteral nutrition or the feeding tube, molybdenum deficiency has not been reported in the U.S. We just don't have this problem here. Okay, so on page 181, we get into ultra trace elements. And these are, they really aren't sure exactly how much we need or, um, you know what the what the relationships are between these ultra trace elements and uh, human nutrition. Uh, so some studies suggest relationships between these elements, uh, which we'll talk about, and the development of cavities, but we don't know enough for sure. So we need to do more research there. 
Um, first up in this list is going to be boron. And please remember too, as you're filling out that uh, chart, you just fill in what you get from the book, okay? The rest of it, don't worry about it. The physiologic roles of boron may have an effect on metabolism or, um, of calcium, phosphorus, manganese, or vitamin D. So we know calcium, phosphorus, manganese, and vitamin D all are absorbed in similar pathways, right? They all affect each other's um, absorption, and so they think that boron may have a may have an effect on that sort of trifecta. Um, and it may be needed to maintain membrane structure. Uh, some sources for boron will be foods of plant origin. We get it from plants, not animals. And then a hypostate can affect mineral metabolism. So nickel, um, it's not totally sure what nickel does in our body, but they think it might have something to do with vitamin B12 metabolism um, and folic acid as well. Nickel uh, sources are going to be dried beans, peas, grains, nuts, and chocolate. They say that a nickel deficiency could result in suboptimal growth in adults and that adequate nickel alters trace element composition of bone and impairs iron use. I'm sorry, inadequate. So if you're not getting enough nickel, they think it might affect your ability to use iron. But again, they're not totally sure. Silicon, um, the physiologic role in the structure and resilience of collagen, elastin, and polysaccharides. So that seems pretty important, right? Um, sources for silicon are going to be in whole grains and root vegetables. Tin is next. And while it has no known function in development or maintenance of bone, it says it may affect bone metabolism because tin accumulates in bone. Um, the physiologic roles in utilization of calcium and zinc, and it can affect that bone growth and maintenance. Um, sources of tin are going to be trace amounts in foods and as a food additive. Uh, so what this means is that people who eat food that are packed in tin cans, um, while all tin cans are coated with a, a lacquer on the inside that's going to help to protect the food from um, the tin itself, um, more acidic foods like pineapple and orange juice and tomato, those kinds of, of acids can over time eat away at the lacquer, the lacquer and it will uh, be able to come in contact with the tin and then when you consume the food you can get some of that tin. Um, the other thing here important is that tin, the chemical term for tin is going to be stannous, which if you guys don't know, stannous is a pretty important word in dentistry, right, for stannous fluoride. Um, and so when we, we think about stannous fluoride, we know that it has that uh, anti-karyogenic property, that anti, or the karyostatic property. Um, and so that's an important af aspect for us. So when you're, you know, you're wondering about stannous and how it works and why it works, um, stannous is tin. Um, aluminum is probably not an essential nutrient uh, in the presence when it's you know uh, in the body it, it does appear to be harmful uh, so we don't want to be consuming aluminum um, or uh, British people say aluminium did you guys know that um, so aluminum will accumulate in bone and has been observed to cause osteodystrophy and it it is thought that aluminum can reduce uh, cavities, but they need to do more research on that. Um, alumina accumulation of aluminum can occur through oral ingestion of aluminum hydroxide antacids. So they do put aluminum sometimes in antacids. Um, and while there is not enough research to show that the aluminum is like uh, absolutely like the cause of detrimental effects there is quite a bit of uh, of kind of controversy over it so if you're concerned just don't have those things uh, the other thing they put it in is going to be deodorant uh, we're seeing a lot more deodorants that are uh, labeled as aluminum free um, you'll look on page 183 and see that health application 10 is about Alzheimer's disease and how for a while there they were beginning to research whether or not aluminum consumption and aluminum in the body could cause 
uh, Alzheimer's disease and what they've found so far is that there isn't there isn't enough research to show that it does so um, you know while uh, it may be something you don't want to be consuming it's something you don't want in your deodorant um, there's no 100% sure uh, factor that it causes Alzheimer's So moving on to lead, there's a lot more research about the harmful effects of lead because of uh, lead-based paint um, that became an issue uh, in the 70s. And then in 1978, they actually uh, kind of made a, um, a law against using lead in paint. Um, and so while it has no known role, in human nutrition, and we do know it is a uh, environmental contaminant that impairs intellectual development in the teeth, it is also harmful. So large proportions of absorbed lead are incorporated into the skeleton and teeth. And uh, when the tooth is forming, any kind of lead that is deposited in that enamel matrix is going to cause a pitting hypoplasia. Moving on to lithium. So lithium can accumulate in the bone, and when it does, it will take the place of calcium in that uh, like hydroxyapatite, right? The appetite formation of the bone and teeth. Um, and when it does so, it will reduce the amount of calcium that is there, which will change the structure and the solubility properties of bone and teeth. So um, we don't wanna have too much lithium in our diet. Uh, vanadium, which um, research has found, has not found that vanadium deficiency consistently impairs any biologic function in animals. That is a very fancy way of saying you don't need this in your diet. <laughs> Sources of vanadium are going to be shellfish, mushrooms, and parsley, and they all contain very small amounts. Uh, there is a uh, thought to be a karyostatic effect vanadium has on uh, caries, obviously karyostatic, but um, they don't know that for sure, so it is still just a hypothesis. Last in chapter 10 is going to be mercury. Mercury is not a nutrient, but it is often found in food and our water supplies. Uh, they do find that too much of this can cause uh, a lot of issues um, especially in children with neurologic and development problems in infants and young children. So we do want to avoid um, for them any amounts of mercury uh, because it is a toxic substance. Um, and the FDA and the EPA recommend potentially vulnerable consumers to limit their intake of albacore tuna to less than six ounces per week. Um, they, they recommend that no one eats more than uh, one serving of tuna per week in order to reduce the amount of mercury. Um, and your book calls it methylmercury, which is M-E-H-G. Um, as far as pregnant uh, women, um, women of childbearing age and nursing women and young children, they do tell them to avoid eating shark, swordfish, mackerel, and tilefish, uh, but it's probably a better recommendation that they just avoid any oceanic fish. All right, so this is the end of the text version of the chapter, but the book does go into a health application 10 on Alzheimer's disease, which is pretty informative. Um, and then in uh, on page 184, it talks about um, uh, box 10.1 and 10.2 both talk about uh, how nutrition plays a role in um, Alzheimer's disease and how to maintain your brain and warning signs of Alzheimer's disease, which for many of us who have um, older individuals in our families um, may be pretty uh, informative for you. If it's not something that's not going to be on your quiz or in your tests for this chapter or for this this course um, but you know just kind of bookmark it and then later when you run into someone who you know is dealing with these kinds of things or you know maybe after hygiene school you are interested in this information um, then you'll have this reference to come back to uh, as far as this chapter goes if you have questions please let me know